So Coolidge, a last Arcadia, the business of government is to leave people to their business. One idea of the way that American statesmanship should work. Now, what's interesting is that another statesman uh, is a very, very influential person in the 1920s, uh, very much behind the scenes at first, but then comes more into being as we go through the presidencies of Harding and Coolidge. And what I'm going to ask you to do is as we <clears throat> discuss this individual, I want you to keep in mind this kind of metaphysics of God, nature, human nature, and human artifice. I've told you that some American presidents, and in particular progressive presidents, believed that it was within their power to use the, the power of the office of the American presidency to make America a better America or to make the world a better world. Two individuals that come to mind in particular are Teddy Roosevelt, who believes that I can use the bully pulpit, the artifice of my office, and I can smash those monopolies and I can put into place a whole bunch of progressive uh, regulations and policies that help out the little guy and make this world a fairer, more just place. Woodrow Wilson likewise believed that he could, through uh, the, the employment of national policy, create not only a, a more just America at home, but a just condition for the world in his pursuit of liberal internationalism. But note there's a difference between that kind of progressive who wants to use the powers of the state to accomplish goals X, Y, and Z, and a Harding or a Coolidge who's more reticent, who believes that normalcy requires kind of a sobriety about what we can do as people who hold office. Well, in the background in the 1920s is this man, Herbert Hoover, who is Secretary of the Commerce. Now, Hoover's a very, very interesting guy for a variety of different reasons, but uh, he was known in his day as the great engineer. So he had grown up, he had gone to Stanford. He was, um, he was kind of very kind of almost like the Bill Gates of his, his day, the Elon Musk of his day. He believed that there was an engineering solution to every problem that we encountered as human beings. And he was in charge during World War I of America's efforts to try to um, relieve Europe of, of the ravages of war. So he would raise money and he would distribute that money and he became very well known in upper policy circles for being a great um, genius and expert who one day would be president of the United States. When Coolidge decides not to run for re-election in 1928, Hoover takes up the cause as the Republican candidate and is widely celebrated as really the person who's gonna take the United States to the next level but then he has to deal with the Great Depression. And as we know, as we'll move into the next chapter in American history, Hoover will be blamed for a lot of the depression that happens on his watch of the presidency. But the piece that I had you read on Hoover that I think is central to understanding him is a piece that he delivers, a speech that he delivers much earlier uh, in the 1920s, a speech that he delivers in 1922 titled American Individualism. And we find this speech on page 1,133 of your AppTap reader. And I'm going to read the beginning of the speech to you and then try to uh, make sense of what's going on here. So here, note Hoover dealt with Europe and all of its ravages. So what does he say about that experience? For myself, let me say at the very outset that my faith in the essential truth, strength, and vitality of the developing creed by which we have hitherto lived in this country of ours has been confirmed and deepened by the searching experiences of seven years of service in the backwash and misery of war. Seven years of contending with economic degeneration, with social disintegration, with incessant political dislocation, with all its seething and ferment of individual and class conflict could but impress me with the primary motivation of social forces and the necessity for broader thought upon their great issues to humanity. Translation, the Europe of World War I was a mess, and nothing that I saw there showed me anything other than the fact that we have a lot of cleaning up to do for human history. Where's the solution going to come from? Next sentence. From all of these experiences, 
I emerge as an individualist, an unashamed individualist. But let me say also that I am an American individualist, for America has been steadily developing the ideals that constitute progressive individualism. What Hoover declares to his audience is what makes the United States different is not simply that it is a progressive nation, right? and we've learned of progressivism, but it is an individualistic nation, that its progressivism and its individualism go hand in hand in making the American experience a unique experience. So think about American individualism on the one hand, that's progressive individualism, in opposition to what we were seeing with Rousseau and Marx. A, a call for what? A call for egalitarian collectivism. So Hoover says, no, no, we don't need that. And Hoover likewise says, we don't need the nihilism that pervades Freud and the thought of Nietzsche. We just need to be good Americans, because if we're good Americans and other people act like we do, they'll be able to clean up their messes. So how does he define this progressive individualism? No doubt, individualism run riot with no tempering principle would provide a long category of inequalities, of tyrannies, dominations, and injustices. America, however, has tempered the whole conception of individualism by the injection of a definite principle, and from this principle it follows that attempts at domination, whether in government or in the processes of industry and commerce, are under an insistent curb. If we would have the values of individualism, their stimulation to initiative, to the development of hand and intellect, to the high development of thought and spirituality, they must be tempered with that firm and fixed ideal of American individualism and equality of opportunity. Note there what Hoover has argued. Unlike Rousseau and Marx, who believe that the problem is individualism, or unlike Freud and Nietzsche, who believe the problem is egalitarianism. What Hoover argues is individualism tempered by equality of opportunity. Individualism tempered by this notion of justice, of equality, will lead to an individualism that benefits the individual, but it also benefits society. Hoover is telling us the great success story that is America, that is a land of hope, is a success story because it's allowed the individual to do what is good for the individual, but to temper their individualism with wanting the equality of opportunity for others. Hoover's theory, widely accepted in the 1920s. Individualism, widely accepted in the 1920s. But what happens when things shift and there's a transformation of the American economy in the Great Depression? Will there still be this embrace of individualism, or will we reject individualism and want something more like what's being offered in Rousseau and Marx and their thought? Something to think about as we enter into the Great Depression.